All right, welcome back everyone. The October 3rd meeting of the Faculty Senate will come to order. We do have a quorum today. The minutes from the September 12th Faculty Senate meeting were distributed with your agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? All right, hearing none, the minutes are approved as written and will be posted onto the Faculty Senate webpage. We're gonna get started today with a report from Provost Marianne Ree. Marianne? Good afternoon. It is good to see you all. This, uh, because I know your meeting is abbreviated um, due to the state of the university, I will promise to keep my remarks short and to the point. Our office continues to focus on academic transformation with a strong push towards improving our student success metrics, including retention, persistence, and graduation rates. Last meeting, I talked about the challenges we faced in that area, particularly coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. One focus this fall, and I talked about this at the State of the U address, um, is to build a targeted program of wraparound support for Pell eligible students, first gen students, and other groups whose unique circumstances make them more vulnerable for dropping out. We will also be working with the Eberly College on establishing a Center for Foundational STEM Instruction, which we believe will help our undergraduates be more successful in their introductory science and math classes. Some other uh, brief updates. While we continue to work with colleges and departments on their program improvement plans, we have completed our pro program portfolio review of degree programs in both health sciences and at West Virginia Tech. We have shared or about to share those results with the leadership of HSC and Tech, and it will be largely upon uh, those leaders to decide how they are going to respond to both programs of concern and programs of opportunity on their campuses. We also continue to work with our academic units to develop and launch new programs of opportunity on the main campus. You'll likely see some of those new majors and curricula come through the Faculty Senate this, this fall um, and this year. The faculty rewards and recognition priority is also an area of focus this fall with pro proposed revisions to the universities. This is a mouthful. Procedures for faculty appointment, annual evaluation and promotion and tenure document. As part of academic transformation, transformation the rewards and recognition faculty committee comprised of 17 faculty members has worked with us over an 18 month period providing feedback on that original draft, and we have made some changes since then. One goal in making changes to the document is to be more inclusive by expanding the definition of what counts in teaching, research, and service, and in doing so to recognize the many contribu contributions made by our faculty to include newer areas, such as public and community-engaged scholarship, social justice and multidisciplinary work across teaching, research and service. Another goal is to add rigor and consistency to the annual evaluation and tenure and promotion processes. For example, one change would be to require some form of external review for anyone going up for promotion to the associate level with the exception of clinical faculty who are primarily hospital or dental corporation employees. This would justify higher salaries and longer contracts for those individuals, and thus put our non-tenured faculty on a more even playing field with our tenure track faculty. Another change would be to make transparent the university's longtime practice of non-renewal of tenure track faculty and non-continuation of tenured faculty for cause. These cases are exceedingly rare, representing less than 1% of all faculty personnel actions. Nonetheless, to ensure that everybody knows the rules, the revised document outlines how the process works and provides guidance to committees and academic leaders who conduct annual and promotion and tenure reviews. 
In doing so, we will demonstrate to our Board of Governors and to our state legislature that we support and reward our productive faculty through every stage of their career and that we maintain high standards and expectations for performance even post tenure. And probably many of you know that almost all universities have some version of this expectation in either their document or in their policies. Currently, Melissa Latimer, Chris Staples, and Tracy Morris out of the Provost Office have been hosting a series of 20 plus town meetings going directly to the colleges, schools, and branch campuses to share the proposed changes. These have been lively conversations for sure, but be assured we are listening and we are making changes in response to the feedback we, we receive. For example, one big change is that we plan to release an annotated version of the draft document by the end of this week, several weeks in advance of our original schedule. Our goal has always been to provide as much context as possible before sharing it, because in such a lengthy document, it would be hard to know exactly what to look for and what the changes are that were made. But we heard loud and clear that faculty want to see the document sooner rather than later, and so we are releasing it. We will also be providing a Qualtrics form where faculty can provide feedback anonymously if they prefer. And we will continue to make changes until the document is uploaded as an appendix to the November faculty, excuse me, the December faculty Senate agenda. If there continues to be questions at that point, we will take the time we need to get it right. But we do need to update the document to address new realities and opportunities. It was last updated in 2014. I want to encourage you and your colleagues to continue to attend these town hall meetings so that you can ask questions and give feedback in real time. And we would be also happy to schedule a town hall meeting with faculty senators if you're interested. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Sure. So Hi, Chris. That's right. Are they being recorded so you can watch later if you can't make that visit? Let me ask uh, Melissa Latimer. And you don't have to go also to your own colleges. You can go to any of them. Okay. Okay. I, I can't see what that question is. Am I missing it? Oh, oh okay. Let, is it in the chat? Oh, I'm sorry. Asad? Asad, yes, you have a question? Yes, thanks. Yes, thanks. Um, I think if I heard correctly, you mentioned Hello. academic transformation. Asad, are you there? Your hand is raised. Yes. Are you mute? No, I'm on I'm mute. Hello. What? We are turning him up in the room, but we don't hear him. Oh, yet. maybe it's in the chat. I'll go look. Hang on a second. Sorry. No, okay. I'm, on, and you, you, I'm sorry. You don't hear me? They can hear him online. Hello, mom. Um, what do I, what do I do? It shouldn't be coming through the. Oh, hi, Assad. We can't hi. hear you. Do you want to put it in the chat? Yeah, I'll maybe I'll do that. <laughs> okay, so we're getting, I think, Assad, you're going to type it in the chat, right? Yes. Yeah, we'll do that. Sure, of course you can. So just a general question. We've heard, um, like with your yours and President Gee's remarks that um, 
retention is has dwindled a little bit and that with the new PT documents um one of the goals is to try to get people in at more competitive salaries but as we like see these trends with retention and obviously you know that's going to play into the budget and the new budget formula i mean how are some of these things going to be addressed to be able to provide higher salaries for faculty and and staff so okay so emily i think what you're saying is that that enroll, enrollment affects our bottom line and retention and persistence affect our enrollment and and all of that is true um and the reality is we we do have a budget shortfall this year it's not huge and we're going to be making that up uh, mostly centrally, but the units will have some impact. Um, I think what I would share with you is that we want to reward and retain our very best faculty. That's a huge priority too. So it isn't just student retention. It's also faculty retention. We're going to have to find a way to balance that um, and, um, you know, figure out a way of, as an institution, number one, how we can grow so that we can have additional revenues and then how we can be more efficient so we can direct those revenues towards things like pay raises. Honestly, um, I think that's the, the balancing act that we have to ex we have to live for the next couple of years. Okay, let's see if we hear from, sorry, I don't see anything from, I don't see anything from Assad, I don't see anything. Oh, could you elaborate on academic transformation for tech? Um, yeah, what I can tell you, Assad, is that we are um, we've shared the results of a program portfolio review uh, with tech, and we're sharing that with with your leaders. Um, and then it will be largely up to them with our guidance and support on how they want to address, again, those programs of opportunity and the programs of concern. Thank you. We just completed that process. So just so you know, it's going to take a little bit of time to work through that. I heard him say thank you, I think. You heard me? <laughs> wow. <laughs> like the voice. Okay. okay, now now that you can hear me, is it for both colleges or on only one college? Is that applied to? You mean tech versus Potomac State? No, 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 no. In, in, at tech, is it for College of Engineering and College of the other college or all? I mean, it's, it's going to apply to all the college. programs? The whole campus. Okay, thanks a lot. Yep, no worries. Any other questions? All right, well then, thank you. Thank you, Provost Reed. So Paul Headings, our Director of Academic Integrity, is going to share some information about the academic integrity process as it applies to students and faculty. We want to welcome Paul to campus. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Headings. I'm the Director of Academic Integrity. I first want to just thank you all for allowing me to come here today. Um, I am new to campus. I joined WVU in March of this year and have really been trying to get out and meet as many of you as I can. So this seemed like a great opportunity to do that in bulk. But uh, at the outset, I just want to say I'd love to continue the conversation with any of you who are interested after this meeting. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I love engaging our faculty, learning what better our office can do to be a good partner to you and your programs and to better grow our programming both for faculty but helping our students prepare for the future. So one of the words that's been talked about a lot today is success and one of the things I tell every student that I meet with in the academic integrity process is that I want them to be successful and I want that success to come at WVU if at all possible. So in that vein um, we try to connect our students uh, to services and programming that are going to help them find that success, because whatever has occurred to land them in our office and in our process clearly shows some deviation from that path to success. Um, I, we see roughly a thousand cases per year. Uh, our office covers uh, WVU here in Morgantown, as well as Potomac State and Tech. Of those cases, we largely see um, upper class 
students uh, in those advanced courses, with seniors being the most reported, uh, followed by juniors. We also um, cover cases involving graduate professional PhD students, um, again, from all three of those campuses and from all but a select number of enumerated programs in our policy. So our office's mission is to carry out the charge in Board of Governors Rule 2.5 to create a fair and consistent system for defining and responding to academic dishonesty. So we have a very long uh, policy online. I won't try to walk you through all of that, but I would like to talk a little bit about how our process plays out so that if you have to come into contact with our office, you have some level of understanding at the outset. We have three main processes. We have an informal conduct process, a formal conduct process, and a hearing level process. And for those who are unaware, there are some legal obligations that we have here in the state of West Virginia. Those are referred to as the North Rights where if we are wanting to program dismiss or otherwise change the status of a student's standing, we are required to provide them due process under the US Constitution that plays out in a hearing. Uh, those are few and far between. Luckily, we, do, we are able to help our students right their ship and get back, back on the path to success uh, without the need for a hearing or potential removal. Our informal conduct process recognizes that the vast majority of students who come to our office are simply those who are going through growing pains. The time at university is a time of profound growth, and it's not only growth in your area of educational study. People are learning how to be adults, they're learning how to be members of a community, and learning what success means for them and how to achieve it. We have to understand that some students are going to make mistakes while they're here, and those mistakes don't mean that they can't be redeemed or help to succeed through those programs and processes that WVU has already. Our informal conduct process allows those students a chance to resolve the allegation against them in a manner that does not create a permanent academic discipline record that could then harm them later, whether they're looking at a graduate or professional program or licensure that requires some level of background checks, or some of the more competitive hiring processes that our graduates see. In that case, a student must accept responsibility for the allegation and recognize formally that their actions do constitute a violation of our policy. In addition to those recognitions, the student must complete a set of given sanctions that will help uh, remediate that behavior, educate them, and help them better be able to move forward in a positive manner. If the student completes all of those things, uh, we do close their case in a manner that does not reflect that they were found to be responsible for a violation. And again, that's really in the vein of um, not marking these students for uh, the future and giving them, the, giving them that chance for growth. Uh, we do see success with this program. We see students take accountability for their actions very often. We do see that growth, and we have seen a drop in our recidivism rate because of these support-centered services. Our formal conduct process uh, does not afford the student the opportunity to keep this from becoming a record for the future. Uh, that is for uh, that process is employed for students who have more egregious violations uh, or are repeat offenders, uh, where clearly the educational remediation from their first time uh, was not enough to help correct their path. If a student has a particularly malicious event or has several events, then we start to get into the territory of a hearing level case, and we begin discussing the prospect of a removal from a degree program or from the university itself. As far as uh, the tools available to our faculty, I know that you all are largely aware of these, but I do want to mention uh, that we do have several tools for detecting and deterring plagiarism and other forms of academic dishonesty embedded in the processes of the university. One of the most helpful tools that we have is called Turnitin. This is embedded in the eCampus software. Turnitin is a program that will run a student's written submission through a database of millions of other student submissions, not only from WVU, but from other educational institutions around the world, as well as uh, running that submission against an open internet search. So you can instantaneously search millions of student submissions as well as the open internet and immediately have concrete evidence of potential plagiarism or other academic dishonesty. 
It takes the guesswork out of plagiarism checks. Um, that report will tell you precisely what percentage of a student's submission is similar letter for letter to some other source. It will tell you where that source is from. If there are multiple sources, it's color coded, it will break it down and tell you um, an itemized list of what percentages add up to the total. And if it is from an open internet source, it will provide you with a link directly to that site so you can check it yourself. Um, that is a great tool that helps ease the burden off of faculty. I know that you have a million things going on um, and that academic dishonesty is unfortunately one of those things that pops up from time to time. I wanna be helpful to you. I wanna be a good partner and I wanna ease that burden as much as I can. So Turnitin is a great tool. We have testing centers, uh, both for students with OAS accommodations, as well as a general testing center on campus uh, that are great tools for helping proctor those exams. I know uh, the age of digital learning has been a real strain on everyone and having to proctor an exam, watching 30 or sometimes more little Zoom boxes on a screen and watch for cheating can be very taxing. Um, we can help with that. We also have software that uses AI to help proctor online exams. So please uh, avail yourself to those technologies. Reach out to me. I'm happy to help point you to those. And I'm also happy to help um, work on deterrence um, programs that you may want to employ in your classes. Speaking of deterrence, one of the best deterrents you can have is to talk about academic integrity in your course. So almost every syllabus, if not every syllabus, has some section on academic integrity, which is fantastic, and I very much appreciate that. It shows our students that we take this very seriously and it, that it's something that we value, um, that accountability being one of our core values. Um, however, the reality is not every student reads every page of every syllabus that closely. And if you spend only a minute or two in one of your first classes of a semester, just mentioning that academic integrity is something you take very seriously, it's something the university values, and it's something that we value as a Mountaineer community, um, that can go a long way to helping deter students from feeling the pressure to act in a dishonest manner. If you feel that you may have um, some academic dishonesty occur in your course, but you're not quite sure, or you're not sure what information we need, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, my philosophy is the more information you give me, the better. I can sift through and see what's relevant or not relevant. I can help with interpreting our policy. I can help you better understand where the process may go. Um, and I really want to work together to help our students correct their behavior, correct that path. Um, I will leave you with a snapshot of the students that we see. Um, they generally fall into one of three groups. The first group of students is a group of people who didn't understand that what they were doing would be considered academically dishonest. You see this a lot with plagiarism where people don't understand patch writing versus paraphrasing, or they don't understand the concept of self plagiarism, or you also see it sometimes on examinations where maybe someone didn't read the directions closely and they thought they could bring a scientific calculator instead of a four function calculator. In those instances, the main driver of their behavior wasn't malice, it was ignorance. And that is something that we can help them correct and something that we can help them understand for the future, that they need to be aware of what's expected of them and that they are responsible for conducting themselves in a manner that comports with those expectations. The second group is a group of students who knew what they were doing is wrong, but felt like they didn't really have a choice. And we've seen this a lot. Uh, we've also heard themes today about how mental health has become one of the foremost issues for students at colleges and universities. And what we see is, especially on examinations later in the semester, some of these high stakes exams, uh, students maybe hadn't studied as hard as they should have, or maybe they just weren't quite getting the, the course material. And they get to that exam and they think, well, if I don't cheat, then I'm probably gonna fail the exam. And if I fail the exam, I'm probably gonna fail the course. And if I fail the course, then my parents may disown me or I won't be able to graduate or I won't get my dream job or my friends won't talk to me anymore. And so they feel backed into a corner where their only real choice is to be dishonest. Now, we all know that that's not the only choice and that that's not the appropriate choice. But in that moment for those students, feeling the weight of the world on them, they can make a poor decision. And in those specific scenarios, I think it's very important that we help those students identify ways to 
uh, cope with stress, to cope with anxiety, and to find academic supports so that in the future, when presented with similar issues, they steer toward a path of honesty and reach out for that support. I know everyone in this room wants to help our students. We want them to succeed. And we all know um, that we can't help people if we don't know there's a problem. So helping our students feel more comfortable coming to us, feel comfortable asking for that help, and then knowing how to provide that bridge to services is very important to me. So I have formed partnerships with the student advocacy team, with Student Success, which houses near peer mentoring, success coaching, and tutoring. And I'm also working to create a direct link with the writing studio to help assist those students who feel those academic pressures, those anxieties, and those stressors feel more comfortable here at WVU and make those um, upstanding, honest choices when presented with hardships. Uh, the third and by far the smallest group of students we see are those who do act with some malicious intent. They either don't think that what they did should be considered wrong, or they didn't think they would get caught, or they don't think that uh, I or someone in my office should even care that this happened. Um, those students unfortunately do exist, but they are few and far between. And those are the students we see as repeat offenders. And those are unfortunately the students who do not typically find success at WVU. I wanna close today by just reminding you, uh, we're here to be a partner. We wanna be helpful in any way that we can. Please, if any of you would like to discuss this more after today's meeting, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I always love engaging in these discussions with faculty and learning how better I can serve you as well as our students. Thank you again for your time. And if there are any questions, I'll take those. So the please identify yourself and repeat the question. Hi, I'm Carla Brigandi, College of Education. Um, I thought I heard that we weren't allowed to have students have the cameras on while they take the tests online anymore. Yeah, so that is actually the Ogletree versus Cleveland State decision uh, that I have here in my hand. Uh, that was from the Northern District of Ohio Federal Court. Uh, we did put out um, a brief paragraph to maybe help faculty feel more at ease. Uh, the baseline here is that decision is not binding in the state of West Virginia or in our federal circuit, uh, nor do the instances seen in that case uh, seem like something that we would experience here at WVU. Uh, we do have testing policies in place that do not violate what the court found to be wrongful there. Um, but what I would suggest to our faculty is to engage in conversations with your leadership about the testing policies that we have, um, about the testing centers we have and how best you can utilize those. Um, and again, just feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, there are ways that we can help ease that burden. This was a case where uh, room checks were done on Zoom where students could see each other's rooms. Uh, and there was a claim about a privacy invasion relating to some tax documents in the room. Again, these are very highly specific facts that are very specific to this case uh, that I don't think we would see here. And even if we did, um, this finding is non-binding and is still subject to appeal in the federal courts. So uh, for now, there's no reason to change the way we go about things, but I would encourage you to consult with your leadership to make sure that you are following university-wide policies um, and making sure that we are going by the book that we wrote. All right, thank you very much. There's a question. All right, thank you, Paul. Kim Floyd, uh, Senator from the College of Applied Human Sciences is going to give us some information about the peer support and teaching program, either one. Hi, everyone probably, I'm Kim Floyd, everyone probably received through e, the e-news, it was also, I think, attached to this agenda about the peer support uh, mentoring that's offered through Teaching and Learning Commons. So I just wanted to highlight a few things that are really, that we feel are really important. Um, first, it's not punitive, it's not evaluative, it's not meant to be remediation, it's really used for people who maybe they're teaching a large class for the first time and want some ideas about engagement, or they're teaching an online course and want to make sure they still have that same social presence. Um, so they meet with their mentor and they determine what's going to happen. They could meet at, at um, Panera's and decide that's all they want to do, or they may want the mentor to observe their teaching and then give them feedback. 
Um, again, all of that is confidential. And actually the feedback that comes from the mentor, if this person would like to put it in their digital measures to show that they've worked on teaching and innovation, they can do that. They can upload the feedback or they can maybe just create a reflection on what they changed and how they worked with their mentor. And that can be loaded to dig digital measures to enhance their teaching effectiveness. And you just access it through the teaching and learning commons. Are there any questions for Kim? Oh, and I was supposed to say, this was the first thing I was supposed to say, <laughs> that it is free for um, full and part-time as well um, as postdoctoral fellows and graduate assistants. All right. Thank you, Kim. Uh, just a reminder for those who have questions, uh, please step to the microphone so that everyone can hear and identify yourself and uh, your colleagues as well. Our next agenda item, Stephanie Hines, the chair of the Inclusion and Diversity Committee is going to share some information about the DEI Teaching and Learning Toolkit. Is this on? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to ask for everyone's help. We are hoping to launch our diversity, um, equity, and inclusion teaching toolkit, teaching and learning toolkit, um, hopefully in the next month or so. Um, and we're just looking for assistance with the committee to find materials, um, things that you found that have worked in your classroom, whether those be icebreakers or, um, you know, things you include in your syllabi or uh, perhaps um, different activities activities in your classrooms, articles, movies, anything like that that may help someone teach um, and include equity, diversity, and inclusion in their teaching. Um, we're really hoping this is a very comprehensive toolkit that's more than we hope to have a lib and media guide, but we really want more than that. We really want active tools to really build out that toolbox. So if you have any suggestions, I think it's in the annex. Uh, there's a Qualtrics link. Please feel free. And our committee will be reviewing those suggestions on a rolling basis. And we really look forward to having help from everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Next item is my report. Um, I want to remind everyone that the Faculty Senate will be hosting a Red Cross blood drive. Uh, that'll be on Thursday, November 3rd, here in the event hall at the law school from noon to 5 p.m. Uh, there's a link to sign up if you want to have an appointment ahead of time, and I believe they'll be taking walk-ins as well. We have had a few questions about uh, the Omicron-specific COVID vaccines. So I reached out to Aaron Neumeyer. Uh, they're distributing vaccines differently than they did in the fall. And WVU does not have its own allotment of vaccines. So the recommendation is um, that faculty should um, seek vaccines at local pharmacies or through your primary care uh, physician. I do want to remind everyone about the PNT town halls. I've been to three of those town halls so far. Um, they are very informative. I've seen the evolution uh, of the presentation uh, from one town hall to the other. Provost team um, are listening. Uh, they're taking our feedback uh, and making changes to the document. As the provost said earlier, the draft guidelines are going to be posted uh, later this week. That will kick off a 30-day public comment period uh, that will close on Friday, November the 11th, preceding a vote here in the Faculty Senate to adopt those new guidelines. So you have the opportunity to provide comments uh, through that Qualtrics forum anonymously. Uh, you also still have the opportunity to provide feedback at the town hall events um, that the town hall schedule is posted uh, on the faculty.wvu.edu webpage. And there's also a link on the Faculty Senate webpage uh, if you uh, would like to attend one of the remaining town hall events. And that concludes my report. Are there questions for me? Eloise, can you, Eloise, step over the mic, just so everyone can. Thank you. Um, the agenda says that the blood drive is November 1st. So is it November 1st or November 3rd? I believe it's November 3rd. That I'm not certain. We'll check and revise that. Thank you. You have the third online. Yes, I believe it is the third. 
but we'll double check and make sure that link's available. Any other questions for me? It's the third. Okay. All right. Our curriculum committee uh, report is next. Uh, our chair, Lori Ogden. Thanks. I have five for approval items. The first is the new courses report found in Annex 2. The second, the course change report found in Annex 3. And then also a program change in social, social work, a program change in recreation parks and tourism resources, and a new program in molecular medicine. So we'll bundle these approval items into one votable item. Are there questions or discussion about annexes two and three, the program change report, or the new program in molecular medicine? So the question is to approve uh, Annex 2 and 3, program changes, uh, the new programs report. So um, all senators in favor, please say aye. We have votes online, Frankie. Any opposed, please say no. So those annexes are approved. Thank you, Lori. Our next agenda item is a report from Diana Davis, Chair of the Teaching Assessment Committee. Hi, Diana Davis, School of Medicine. So the committee is primarily working on four products for this semester in support of the pilot project for the new, um, new student perception of instruction tool. Um, we have already developed the first draft of a survey that will be used and administer and given to faculty who are using the new tool as part of the pilot system. That is currently in revision and will hopefully be approved by the committee and then forwarded to faculty senate um, next month. We're working on three lar uh, relatively large education projects. One is a guide for the new for the faculty in the pilot program to use to be able to customize the new tool. So how to, you know, how to go into the um, blue system and customize that tool and get that tool ready for use. We're hopeful to have that done. That'll be um, a series of screenshots with click by clicks, you know, click here, click there um, by late October so that people can get the tool customized for the end of the semester. The second tool we're doing is the second educational project we're working on is um, developing guidelines on how to use the data from the new instrument. This will need to be done by the end of December because that is for the review committees, um, p and review committees and division chairs on how to handle the data and what kind of data they can expect to see from the new instrument. And then the third thing that we're doing is just developing a lot of information about what the new instrument is, how it was developed, the research that it was based upon, um, best practices in developing new tools uh, so that the individuals who are using the new tools and the review committees can be familiar with how that tool came to be. All of that work is hopeful to be done by December. Um, so we're working very quickly on that. Um, and that is my report. Are there questions for Diana? Thank you, Diana. Next, we'll hear from the chair of the General Education Foundations Committee, Lisa DeBartolomeo. You will be happy to hear I have no report. Thank you, Lisa. Next agenda item is a report from the chair of the Committee on Committees, Leslie Cottrell. Leslie. Hello. I'm going to stand on my tiptoes. Um, so the Committee on Committees has submitted Annex 5 for everyone's review. These are standard updates to our membership across the committees. The largest piece um, this month is ex officios, trying to get those members appropriately across the committees, and we appreciate everyone identifying. Um, and then as well as student reps. Don't forget our student reps on the committees. So you have that for approval. So the question is approval of Annex 5. All those in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? So that motion carries. Thank you, Leslie. 
Next is a report from um, our representative to state government, Eloise Elliott. You'll be happy to know that I don't have a report either. I don't want to slow this freight train down a lot, but uh, Eloise, can you speak at all to what's going on at Bluefield State? I know they're trying to abolish their Senate, the, the college there. Um, the, the thing that I know about that right now is there's a discussion um, among the universities if they have just an assembly or if they have a Senate or if they have an assembly and a Senate. And uh, we're having a meeting in a couple of weeks, so I'll know more information then. I thought you were going to get off easy, Eloise. <laughs> A representative to state government, the Board of Governors has no report. Are there any questions for Stan? All right, is there any new business? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.